We are in middle of the 13 Principles of Faith series. We are in principle number 11, and that is the notion of reward and punishment, a concept experienced primarily by the soul after death. And consequently, we have dedicated a few episodes to talk about the nature of the soul. We spoke about the anatomy of the soul, the five different parts of the soul, and how they are interconnected. We spoke about the origin of the soul, the idea of the creation of the soul by God, ex nihilo, directed by God. Of course, it's not part of God. Believing that something's part of God or has a piece of God would be tantamount to heresy. We spoke about the transposition of the soul, where a soul goes from its heavenly origins from this heavenly chamber, from this heavenly vault, the angel takes it out and merges it with the body, the union of the body and the soul, and the conflict that that creates. Today, I want to address and expand upon something that we mentioned briefly last episode. We spoke last time about how there's a difference between Jewish and Gentile souls, and today, I want to to dedicate our time to understanding exactly what the differences are. What are the unique characteristics and markers of Jewish souls? How is it different? And how is it unique? Now, along the way, as typically happens, we're going to talk about a lot of other things that are going to collectively build our repertoire of knowledge that we're trying to do here in this series. But we're also going to deal with a lot of the critical aspects of Jewish philosophy and Jewish eschatology. We're going to talk about the nature of Adam before his sin, the nature and the consequences of his sin, the responsibility of mankind to rectify Adam's sin, the history of how it was rectified over time and the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of how humanity has succeeded and or failed over the course of the time since Adam's sin. We're going to talk about the role of the patriarchs and the transformations that they did and the concept of spiritual epigenetics where the accomplishments, the spiritual accomplishments of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were perpetuated in their descendants. I also think that this subject is going to position us really well for some of the upcoming subjects that we're going to, please God, delve into in the series on the 13 Principles of Faith. Now, before we begin, some disclaimers are in order. What you are about to hear is somewhat Kabbalistic, and I always like to remind the audience that I'm not an expert in these matters. I don't profess to be one. It's very advanced stuff. And what we're going to say is just just what we read and what we learned and what we discovered and how we understand it. But I don't profess to be an expert in these very lofty, advanced subjects. But I also think that, you know, given what we've studied hitherto, I think we're, we're positioned to understand this important subject. A lot of what we're going to cover today is built upon what we have previously discussed the nature of the soul, the anatomy of the soul, the conflict of the soul, if there was ever a time that we were properly positioned to process and understand this very nuanced subject, I think that time is now. So that's disclaimer number one, heavy, deep stuff upcoming. As a result, I don't say this often, This is one of those episodes you want to listen to twice or maybe even 101 times. That's why, of course, it's called Torah 101. I don't like to, you know, toot my own horn and and talk my own book, as they say. But this is a very lofty subject, very advanced subject, a lot of moving parts. And you don't want to miss some of the nuance. Maybe give it a second listen. We will begin our exploration at the same place where all the mysteries and all the riddles of the soul begin. We start with Adam. 
The Talmud makes a puzzling statement about the differences between Jews and Gentiles. This is found in a few places in the Talmud. So, for example, Yevamos 61a, in the book of Sanhedrin you find it, in the book of Odazar you find it. It says like this, Atem Kruyim Adam. You are called Adam. Adam, Adam. You are called, you are deemed, you are considered Adam. Ve'ein ha'ov de'tochavim kruyim Adam. But the nations, the Gentiles, they are not called, they're not deemed, they're not considered Adam. So the Talmud is differentiating for us the Jews and the nations. What's going on over here? What does it mean that we are deemed, we are considered Adam, they are not deemed, they're not considered, they're not called Adam? Now, this is particularly confusing because the word Adam, Adam, typically translates as man or mankind. As a result, this Talmud has been mistranslated as saying, Jews are mankind and non-Jews are not mankind. That, of course, sounds very chauvinistic, very elitist, but it's also a mistranslation. The better translation, and we'll see what this means, is you are deemed Adam and they are not deemed Adam. Well, what is Adam? So the Talmud, the book of Shabbos, on page 89a, we read the following. This is a very famous piece in the Talmud. It's talking about Moshe ascending to heaven to extract the Torah from the heavenly realm. And when the angels see Moshe, they are completely mystified. Why is there a human, an earthling, walking amongst us? And we know the story. They want to kill Moshe, and they say, God tells the angels, well, he's here to get the Torah. They they, they can't believe it. The Torah, the holy Torah that's been here, chambered with you for 974 generations before the world's created, and you want to give it to lowly flesh and blood. And Moshe is called upon to respond to the angels, and he successfully argues his case before the angels. And he proves why the Torah should be on earth. It should be in the hands of humans. That's the Talmud that we're familiar with. The Talmud continues by telling us what happened next. After Moshe negotiated and triumphed over the angels, the whole back and forth, the Talmud tells us, every one of them became a friend of Moshe. And every one of the angels gave Moshe a secret. And it quotes a verse in Psalms, Psalms 68. Alisa Lamaram, you ascended to heaven. Shavisa Shevi, you took a captive. Lakachta Matanos Be'adam. You took gifts Be'adam because of Adam, because of Adam. Says the Talmud. In the merit, in the reward that they called you Adam, Adam, man, you took gifts. And the Talmud concludes that even the angel of death, the arch foe of humanity, even the angel of death gave Moshe a gift. He told him, what is the kryptonite of the angel of death? It's the ktores. It's the incense offering. And when the Jewish people were being decimated and destroyed in the aftermath of the Korach rebellion, Moshe tells Aaron, I remember something. The angel of death is amongst us. The only way to thwart it, the only way to stop it, is with is with is with ketores, is with incense. And Aaron takes the incense and stands between the living and the dead. So here we have one definition of what is meant by the term Adam. Moshe, in the merit that he was called Adam, he was given gifts by the angels. Adam means someone who is loftier than angels, someone who triumphs over angels, someone who angels want to befriend, someone who angels want to give gifts to, someone who gets the ace up his sleeve to overcome the angel of death. 
What does it mean to be Adam? It means to have the angel of death beholden to you, subject to you. You know how to dominate it. You get his secrets too. That is one definition of Adam. Our sages offer a second definition. Adam, the Hebrew word Adam, spelled Aleph, Dalad, Mem, Adam, says the Talmud, Adam stands for Afer, Dam, Mara. The Aleph, the first letter of Adam, is Afer, meaning ashes. The second letter, Dalad, is for Dam, which means blood. And the third letter, the Mem, is for Mara, which means bile. What is Adam? Nothing more than ashes, blood, and bile. Nothing of real importance, nothing of real value. Material that you could buy for a couple of dollars at the drugstore, some collection of matter, it's not really valuable. So this, this word Adam really seems to have dual meanings. Of course, Adam is also the name of the protagonist, or shall we say villain, of the Genesis story, Adam and Eve. And we know what happened there. The word Adam, Adam, also means a person, a generic person, man, humanity, mankind. So this word really has, you know, a rich spectrum of meanings. It means the person who triumphs over the angels gets gifts from the angels. It's Adam in the Genesis story. It's also the lowly man, ashes, blood, and bile. So the term Adam spans the panoply of mankind from its loftiest heights to its lowliest lows. When the Talmud tells us we are deemed Adam, you are deemed Adam, you are considered Adam, Atem Kriyam Adam, and the non-Jews, they are not deemed Adam. We have to know which Adam is being referenced. It is misunderstood as saying that you are a human and they are subhuman. Again, the word means mankind. It also means the original Adam. It means the Adam that triumphs over the angels. In this context, Adam when it says that you are considered Adam and the, and the non-Jews are not considered Adam, it is referring to the highest and loftiest sense of the word. The difference between Jews and non-Jews stems from Adam. Which Adam? The highest Adam, the primordial Adam, the angel-like Adam, Adam before his sin. Let's explain. There is no subject in our philosophy as tantalizing and confusing and mysterious as the subject of Adam before his sin. Who was he? Better yet, we can ask, what was he? What was the nature of his test? What did he do? Why did he do what he did? This is a huge, huge, huge subject. There are entire books written on this subject. Perhaps we could say all books are really written on this subject. But here we could ballpark stuff. We could simplify stuff. Let's simplify. Let's look at the sources. The Midrash tells us that when Adam was created before his sin, the angels thought he was God, and they sought to worship him. This is found in the Midrash, Bereshit Rabbah, chapter 8, section number 10. Bishah Shebar Kosh Baruch Adam Rishon, at the time when God created Adam, the original Adam, To'u Malachi Asharis, the angels of God, the ministering angels, they made a mistake. Ubitshu Lomar Lefanov Kadosh, and they wanted to, to declare upon him, Kadosh, holy. They mistook him for God. This is Adam in his apex. His holiness, his stature prior to his sin, his holiness, his stature prior to his sin, was so great 
that the angels mistook him for God and sought to worship him. That is the loftiness of Adam. Supernal holiness that confused the angels. It's not easy to confuse angels. The angels subjected themselves to Adam. This is similar to Moshe. Moshe also had the angels subjected to him and they gave him gifts. That's Adam before his sin. And then he sinned. And the Talmud tells us the book of Sanhedrin, page 38b, prior to his sin, Adam was misov ha'olom sofo. He was from one end of the world to the other end of the world. What that means, I don't know. But he was this expansive entity that dominated the entire world. Once he sinned, the Almighty placed his hand upon Adam, whatever that means, umiato, and diminished him. So Adam was Adam before his sin, was Adam after his sin, but it's a very different Adam. One Adam is something so holy that it just encompasses everything. It's one notch lower than God. The angels made a mistake. And then afterwards, he was diminished. He was reduced. Our status tell us that prior to his sin, Adam had no Yetzirah. The evil was all external, embodied, of course, by the serpent. With the sin, evil became mixed with good. Good and bad were not operating within him. Thomas tells us Adam was created circumcised, and with his sin, he reversed his circumcision. Again, the idea of good and bad operating within a person, within Adam, in an admixture. And of course, as a result of his sin, he was booted from the garden. And there are two cherubs placed on the garden's gate. And there's the flaming, swirling swords guarding the entrance, guarding the entrance, so Adam cannot get to the tree of life. So whatever Adam was before his sin, it's something vastly different and loftier than Adam post his sin. Now, the Kabbalists, they give us some Kabbalistic framing for what happened to Adam. I think this is something, you know, thanks to our journey thus far, this is something that we can at least vaguely appreciate. The human soul, we've been told many times, is composed of five parts. Adam had a grand, collective, expansive, lofty soul, but Adam's soul was also comprised of five parts. And of course, we went through this before, in ascending order, there's the nefesh, lowest one, then the ruach, then the neshama, then the chaya, and then the yechida. This is found not just in the Kabbalistic literature, it's found in the Midrash, it's found in many places. Now, Kabbalistically, these five components of the soul are situated, are centralized in five different parts of a person. The nefesh, the lowest part, is found in the liver. And that corresponds to desires. And then the ruach is found in the heart. And the neshama is in the brain. And then the chaya and the yechida, the two highest parts of the soul, they're really above a person's head. They're not within the person's body, but they're kind of associated with the person, but they're elevated above the person. When Adam was created... He was perfect. All five parts of the soul were perfect. And then he sinned. And all five parts of his soul were damaged. And the Kabbalists elaborate. Adam's sin, whatever it was, contained elements of the three cardinal sins. Idolatry, adultery, and murder. And that damaged the three parts of his soul that are within him, the nefesh, the ruach, and the neshama. And the two parts that are higher, the chaya and the yichida, were lost entirely. So previously, Adam had five parts of the soul, everything pristine. Afterwards, 
the three parts that are within a person, he still had them, nefesh, ruach, neshama, but they're damaged. They have been destroyed to a certain extent. And the two higher parts are gone. And again, he was Adam. He remained Adam. He retained that name. But previously, he was this lofty Adam, higher than angels. And thenceforth, he was reduced. He was diminished. Psalms says he's really not very different than an animal. This is a very lowly Adam. And of course, he's locked out of the garden. He cannot access the tree of life. And the mission of mankind ever since that point is to fix the damage of Adam's sin and to restore the state of Adam the way it was before his sin. We have to get back into the garden. And of course, we have a name for that existence. It's called Olam Abba. But that is, in one sentence, the mission statement of mankind to fix the sin of Adam, to rectify what Adam broke, and to restore the glory and the splendor that existed previously. To restore the resplendent Adam back to the way it was prior. And for a long time, there was no headway in this mission. Enter the patriarchs. And again, the Kabbalists guide us and they tell us, Abraham, he fixed the nefesh. Isaac started off with a fixed nefesh and he fixed the next part. He inherited Abraham's perfected nefesh and he fixed the ruach. And Jacob inherited the perfected nefesh, thanks to Abraham, the perfected ruach, thanks to Isaac, and he perfected part number three of the soul within man. He perfected the neshama. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made tremendous strides in rectifying the sin of Adam, and thereby restoring the original Adam in all its pristine glory. The Midrash tells us, quoting a verse in Joshua, this is Joshua chapter 14, verse 15, it talks about Ha'adam, the Adam, Hagadol, the great one, Ba'anakim, amongst giants. The great giant Adam. Says the Midrash, who is this great giant Adam? Ze Avraham. This is Abraham. And why is Abraham the great Adam? Why is he the uber Adam? Why is he the super Adam? Because really, he should have been created prior to the original Adam. But God said, what's going to be if the original Adam is going to do a sin? And if Abraham preceded him, well, then there's no one to fix what Adam destroyed. Therefore, I will create Adam first. And then if Adam corrupts, destroys, at least there is Abraham in the bullpen, the great giant Abraham, the great giant, the great giant Adam, and he's there in the bullpen to fix what Adam destroyed. The Midrash tells us that Abraham is the super Adam. He really should have preceded him, but he was created after Adam to fix the sin of Adam. So who's called Adam so far? We have Adam called Adam. We have Moshe called Adam. We have Abraham called Adam. And Abraham, of course, started it. He started to fix what Adam did. And then this was extended to Isaac and Jacob. They built upon the fixing of Abraham. And the result of that is perfection of all three parts of the soul that are within the domain of man. And by the way, this is why we say God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. They fixed the sin of Adam in the three components of the soul that are within a person. They fixed the nefesh, the ruach, 
and the neshama, respectively. In the very dramatic vision of Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw the image of Adam. This is Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5. Which Adam did he see? So you look at Rashi, or say, just tell us. He saw the visage, the countenance of Jacob. Under the throne of God, there is a vision of Jacob. Jacob is etched on the throne of God. Why Jacob? Because Jacob is the ultimate representative of Adam. Why? Because he marks the conclusion of this triumvirate of perfection. Abraham starts it, Isaac continues it, and Jacob completes it. He finished the perfection of man, the three parts that are, again, within the person. Abraham started it, Isaac perpetuated it. Isaac, of course, starts with what Abraham already accomplished. And Jacob concludes it, and therefore the perfection of Adam is embodied by Jacob. Now, of course, there's still more perfection needed. We're not done. Adam, of course, had five parts, three within him, but two that were associated with him, almost like antenna. It's outside, but it's connected to a person. To actually complete this rectification, we need to fix the final two parts. We still need to perfect, really to recover, the two other parts of the soul, the Chaya and the Yechida, that flew away. Well, when did that happen? At Sinai, our sages tell us, the nation got a small taste of what the ultimate perfection looks like. The Talmud tells us, again, a very famous Talmud we've discussed in the past, when the Jewish people said, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will listen, angels came bearing crowns. And every one of the 600,000 Jewish souls received two crowns atop their head. What are those two crowns? Those are the two parts of the soul that have flown away. Again, they're not part of who a person actually is, not within a person, but it is associated with a person. Those two parts of the soul that, thanks to the sin of Adam, owing to the sin of Adam, they had disappeared. Now they were restored. Those two crowns, the two final components of the soul. At Sinai, at the Revelation, the nation became a replica of Adam pre-sin. Thanks to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have perfected the nefesh, the ruach, and the neshama. And thanks to declaring, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will listen, they got the two crowns back, they got the chaya and the yechida back, and now the path to once again entering the garden and getting the tree of life, the path to Torah is now open before them. The only way to get the tree of life, the only way to get the Torah, is if you have rectified what Adam has wrought, and you can get back into the garden. At that moment, Jewish people say, Nasav Nishma, we will do and we will listen. They get those two crowns, and now they have a replica of Adam, the way it was before the destruction. They could get in, they could get the Torah which, of course, is called the tree of life. Now, with the sin of the golden calf, what happened? We have a redux of the sin of Adam. Those crowns are taken away. Only Moshe retains his Adam pre-sin state. Only Moshe retains those crowns. Now, our sages tell us that every Shabbos, we get them back temporarily. That's the extra soul that we get on Shabbos. But in Omaba, we get them back permanently. Now, another after effect of this sin is the tabernacle. Had the nation not sinned with the sin of the golden calf, we would not have a tabernacle. Why? Because the tabernacle is a specific point in the world where the close connection to God reigns. 
had the Jewish people not sinned, had they maintained their crowns, whenever someone would invoke the name of God, they would have the ability to have a direct relationship with him. It says as much so in the aftermath of the revelation at Sinai, chapter 20 of Exodus. With the sin, that close Sinaitic connection is limited to one point in the world. It's found in the tabernacle, it's found in the temple, but it's not found elsewhere. Again, those tablets, the tree of life, are once again locked behind cherubs. Of course, in Olam when Adam's sin is fixed for good, the world will be filled with knowledge of God like water fills the seabeds. So let's see where we are. Let's get a little station idea, as they say. Recap. Before Adam's sin, he had a perfected five levels of the soul. With his sin, all five parts of the soul were altered and or damaged. The two highest ones, well, they flew away from him. He was severely spiritually diminished. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they begin the process of fixing what Adam destroyed. Abraham, well, he fixed the nefesh. Isaac fixed the ruach. Jacob fixed the neshama. For a brief fleeting moment, we actually had access to those last two crowns, but with the exception of Moshe, we lost them. And of course, we hope that we will be privy to the restoration of those two crowns speedily in our days. And of course, thanks to the patriarchs fixing the sin of Adam, we say God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, and we don't say that about anyone else. And by the way, there are, there are five different prayers corresponding to Abraham, who fits the nefesh, we have shachras, the morning prayer. Corresponding to Isaac, who fits the ruach, we have mincha, the afternoon prayer. Jacob, of course, he is the nightcap. He established, he enacted the myriv, the arvit, the evening prayer, and he fits the neshama. And when we pray these three prayers, we're trying to channel the transformation that they did to make sure that we acquire it and we reinforce it within ourselves. But of course, there are two more prayers that we don't say every day. There is Musaf, and then there is Ne'ila. When do we say Musaf? On Shabbos and festivals. There are times that we temporarily get those crowns back, or at least one of those crowns. The extra soul, not the extra souls, the extra soul. Perhaps the Mosef is corresponding to Joseph. And then once a year, on Yom Kippur, at the very conclusion of Yom Kippur, we say Ni'ilah. Yom Kippur is called Shabbos Shabbason. It's the Uber Shabbos. That's that one fleeting moment that we have not just one, but both of the missing crowns. Now, these five elements of our quest for perfection are found in many places. We know we just had the festival of Pesach. At the Seder, there are five cups. We have, of course, the four cups. And then we have the fifth cup, the cup of Elijah, the cup that corresponds to the idea of complete and total perfection of Olam Abba, of the restoration of the original Adam in all of its splendor. We're not quite there yet, and that's why we fill up the cup of Elijah, and we hope he'll show up, because there's one night a year where this perfection, this ultimate perfection, is most auspicious or mo most possible, and therefore we want to be ready for it should it arrive. And if not, we have to wait until next year. So let's get back to our original question about what is the difference between a Jewish soul and a Gentile soul. Back to our original citation. 
Atem Kruim Adam. You are considered, you are deemed, you are called Adam. And the Gentiles, they are not called, they're not deemed Adam. In this context, the word Adam, Adam, does not mean a person. It is a reference to Adam, the original Adam, in all of its glory. Like the original Adam, completely perfect, before his sin, before his demotion, when he was so lofty that the angels mistook him for God. Just one notch below God. Moshe, he is another picture of what this looks like. He's loftier than the angels. He triumphs over them in his arguments, and he's granted gifts because he is Adam. Abraham is called Adam HaGadol Barakim, the great giant Adam. The image of Adam is the image of Jacob. That is the Adam being discussed here. Abraham began this process of perfecting what Adam had destroyed, and Abraham became more Adam than Adam himself. And the Talmud is telling us, we are deemed, we are considered, we are called Adam while they are not. Meaning that the perfection of the soul accomplished by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, again, Abraham perfecting the nefesh, Isaac, the ruach, Jacob, the neshama, that was perpetuated to their children. So just like Isaac starts off on second base or on third base, he really has incorporated within him what Abraham accomplished, and he passes that on, what Abraham accomplished and what he accomplished, he passes that on to Jacob. The Jewish nation, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have a little bit of what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob already accomplished. We have an element of Adam-like perfection thanks to the hard work of our antecedents. The Gentiles do not have that. And by the way, the Zohar says something really interesting. There are some other people part of this family. Ishmael. Ishmael is called Pere Adam. What does Pere Adam mean? Adam is Adam. Pere means wild. Says the Zohar, he has a little bit of this Adam thing, because after all, he's a descendant of Abraham. Another word, by the way, used in the literature to describe this perfection is the word kol, meaning everything. The word kol is described, is you is used to describe Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Bakol, Mikol, Kol. Adam, Kol, Adam. What does it say about Ishmael? Who Yehia Pera Adam? He will be a Pera Adam. Yado Bakol. He'll have his hand in Kol. Meaning that there's a part of this family or of this dynasty that's like a, an offshoot, a Pera Adam, part of Adam, a hand in Kol, but not like the Jewish nation, not the OG, not the original family that has Kol and that has Adam. Now, these elements of perfection were bequeathed to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the idea of spiritual epigenetics that I mentioned earlier. In the beginning of chapter 5 of Perke Avos, we read two successive Mishnahs, two successive teachings in the Mishnah. One of them is talking about genealogy. Ten generations from Adam to Noah. Ten generations from Noah to Abraham. And if you look at that Mishnah, it talks about Abraham. Asara, Doros, Minoch, Va'ad, Avraham. There are ten generations from Noah to Abraham. Who are we talking about? Noah and Abraham. And then it continues. Abraham came and took all the merit, all the reward of those 10 preceding generations. So we have Noah, we have Abraham. That's one Mishnah. The next Mishnah talks about Abraham's righteousness. 
But this time, Abraham has a different name. Asara Nisionos Nisnase Avraham Avinu. With 10 trials, with 10 challenges, Abraham, our forefather, was tested. Continues the Mishnah. Avraham Avinu. This reveals to us how beloved Abraham, our forefather, was. Same person in successive Mishnayos is different, different names. When it talks about his genealogy, he is just Abraham. When it talks about his righteousness, he's Abraham Avinu, our father. So the commentary has explained the Rochaim, for example. He tells us there's something unique about Abraham's spiritual triumphs. In the, in the capacity of Abraham as someone who overcame tests, he is our father, meaning that we inherit those qualities. There's a point in history where the triumphs, the conquests, the spiritual accomplishments of the antecedents became inborn in the DNA of their descendants. Quotes a verse in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. Mishalech betumo tzadik, someone who walks with God with righteousness, is a tzadik. Ashrei banav acharav, praiseworthy, meritorious are his descendants afterwards. A righteous person who works really hard, the kids benefit because they inherit those qualities, those achievements of their forbearer, of their progenitor. The Talmud tells us, this is in the book of Yavamos, page 79a, there are three markers, three attributes, three qualities of this nation, of the Jewish people. Merciful, bashful, and kindly. These are the three qualities we inherited from our three patriarchs. Jacob gave us mercy. Bashfulness we got from Isaac. And of course, kindliness. Chesed Lavraham. The kindliness comes from Abraham. Along these lines, our nation, we are deemed Adam. We are like Adam. We have a perfected soul. Our soul is materially different thanks to the soul that we inherited from our antecedents, thanks to the perfection that Abram, Isaac, and Jacob did to their soul, and that soul, or that perfection of soul, was given to their descendants. The Ramchal has a very nice framework of this idea. This is found in the Way of God, section number 2, chapter number 4. He likens Abraham to a tree. Abraham's like the tree trunk the roots of the tree, and the Jewish people are like the branches, are like the fruits, are like the leaves on that tree. So if you have a seed of a tree, it's an apple tree. It's going to have apple trunk qualities and apple branches and apple fruits. That's the way it works. Why should the fruits be apples just because the seed was an apple, just because of the truck. That's the way trees work. The nations of the world are distributed like trees. And the branches of Abraham's tree are like Adam, like Adam before his sin. That's the nature of that tree. And it produces souls that are like the root. And thus, we are deemed Adam, but the nations that stem from a different tree, they have different fruits. They are not deemed Adam. And the Ramchal there explains that there are 70 different root trees, and that's the idea of the 70 nations. And then there is this one tree, this Adam-like tree, of this one family, of this one dynasty, where the patriarchs, they created this perfected soul of Adam, and that is the kind of fruits that it bears. It's important to note that we put in some work as well. The notion of the Egyptian exile, it is likened to an iron crucible. 
in our scripture. And that's the idea of our nation perfecting and cementing the perfected soul that we received from our antecedents. The hundreds of years of servitude in Egypt and the subsequent exodus, that cemented the soul that our nation has, the fruits of our nation's tree, into an upgraded Adam-like one. And by the way, what's the symbolic mitzvah of the Jewish nation? That's the circumcision. That's the undoing of the sin of Adam. Our sages tell us all of Israel has a portion in the world to come. We are all, thanks to our antecedents, we're already perfected to the degree that we have already earned entry to Olam Abba. How do you get to Olam Abba? You have to undo the sin of Adam. Well, we have that just by default. Barring something that we would do to undo that status, barring, again, proverbially, the restoration of the foreskin, by default, we're in. A Gentile, they may have the same hardware, they also have a soul, also comprised of five parts, but the hard work of fixing that was not done yet, and therefore they have to earn it, by default, they're out. But we, because we have an atom like soul, we are in by default. Moreover, Ramchal tells us, Gentiles who are righteous, they can earn a ticket to Olam Abba. But to enter, they have to ride on the coattails of Abraham. They have to hitch a ride, so to speak, with the Jewish people. Perhaps we can say they have to graft their branch to the tree of Abraham. The, the Jewish people, the Jewish people, we have Torah. We can have Torah because we can relate to the heavenly, godly wisdom. We start off halfway there. The national mission of our people is to bring Messiah. If they get those last two crowns. It's our mission because we're the only people that can do it. We are born on third base. We're born with a spiritual silver spoon in our mouth. We have this built-in advantage. Of course, not thanks to our own doing. We're part of this tree. We're lucky. We're fortunate. We have the three inherent parts of our soul. They are already atom like And therefore, we can already move on to the next stage of the final two, maybe the final one. But no other nation can. So what's the difference between Jewish souls and Gentile souls? What we would say is that, you know, if you just look at them, you take out all of the work done to it, physiologically, it's the same. The only difference is, we're like Adam, they're not. The same hardware exists across the board, one is perfected already, thanks to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forming that kind of tree, and one is not there yet. Hosea's tell us that even in heaven, these two kinds of souls are segregated. A very ancient piece in the Talmud, in the book of Avodah Zarah, page 5a, the Talmud is talking about the importance of the mitzvah of procreation, and the Talmud tells us that the son of David, namely Messiah, will not come until all the souls have been depleted from the heavenly vault of souls called Guf. So there's a vault in heaven called Guf. That's the name of this vault. And inside this vault, inside this chamber, are all the souls that are yet to be born. And therefore, to procreate, well, that accelerates the redemption. It's so important to procreate because that is bringing about, effectuating the redemption. So Tosfos, the Tosfos commentary, asks a really interesting question. Why is it so important for us to procreate? Why can't we outsource the depletion of souls from that heavenly chamber to the Gentiles? Let them deplete the souls. Why is it so important for us to procreate? We could use, shall we say, low skilled labor for this? So that's the question, really interesting question. If it's so important, such an imperative to deplete those souls from heaven, why do we need to do it? 
outsource it to someone else? That's the question, interesting question. But the answer that it tells us is that actually, no, there are different vaults. There's one vault in heaven where all the Jewish souls are housed, where all the perfected souls, or again, the Adam-like souls, the ones that are considered, they're deemed, they're called Adam. The ones that stem from the branch of the tree of Abraham. And that has to be depleted for Messiah to come. We cannot outsource that to the nations. These are very different souls, thanks to one being perfected, one being Adam-like, and one being not Adam-like. And by the way, this is not so rosy. Talmud tells us that the more perfected a person is, the bigger the target on their back is. The Yetzirah, the Satan, attacks strength, not weakness, holiness, not lack of holiness. And therefore, the Jewish people are likely, not likely, they are going to suffer more concerted attacks by the Satan, by the Yetzirah. Only Adam could have been targeted by the serpent. He was so holy, and therefore, to balance things out, the attack is that much greater. At the moment when God is handing over the tablets, this apex of connection between human and God, only then could the Satan, could the angel attack us with a sin like the golden calf. The Jewish people, owing to their elevated atom like state, they have a much stronger opposition. Now, relevant to this question is, what now? So we mentioned earlier briefly, Ishmael is kind of like a halfway home there. He's half an atom, half a kol. Para adam, yado bakol. There's a good reason to believe that with the Messiah, the parts of our tree, of Abraham's tree, that has, or that have fallen off, they have to be restored. They have to come back to their roots. Some of the sources say that Messiah can only come once these other parts, Asaph, Ishmael, the other parts of the family, only once they rejoin the tree of Abraham, only then can this total perfection be unleashed on the world. But one final point, I think, just to round out this subject, is the question of conversion. When someone converts, how does that happen? So a Gentile, we mentioned earlier, a Gentile can get Olamaba, they graft themselves to a different tree. They hitch a ride. They ride on the coattails of Abraham. What about converts? How can someone who is not part of the biological family of Abraham, how can they join the fold? Now, the subject of conversion in Jewish philosophy is a very big, interesting, fascinating subject. But here's briefly how that happens. Of course, our nation has experienced a lot of tumultuous upheavals in our around 4,000 year existence. And there are parts of our people that have gotten absorbed by other nations. You know, the Jews, we've had a long history. We're a wandering people. We're an itinerant nation. And along the way, there was some attrition. So there are some souls of Abraham, part of this Adam tree, Abraham tree, that have just gotten lost. They are original souls of Abraham. They just don't know it. And something may happen that may trigger a certain unstoppable drive to go back home. Some of the converts are actually Jews that no one knows. 
There's no way to know that. There's no way for us to inspect the DNA. We can't do a genome sequence. We can't do a, a swab in 23 me to find out the origin of the soul. And therefore, there are some converts who are actually are part of the family of Abraham. They just don't know it. And they're just coming home. There are other converts that are part of the family of Abraham through a circuitous fashion. When Abraham and Sarah, when they left to go to the land of Canaan, they took the souls that they made in Haran. The souls that they made in Haran. How did Abraham and Sarah create souls? So Rashi says, well, it's the converts. It's not the souls, it's the people that they influenced. But the Kabbalists tell us, Abram and Sarah you know, spent 70 years together without a child, but they were still producing souls. Meaning that they procreated in this other fashion and it created souls, but it didn't create a body with a soul until Isaac came around. And therefore, there are lots of souls. We don't know how many. Of course, it's a very advanced subject to even think about. But there are souls floating around that are actually descendants, literal descendants of Abraham and Sarah. And they're just, again, coming home. They're part of the street. They just don't know it. And by the way, that's why a convert is called Ben Avraham and Bat Sarah. They are literally the souls born to Abraham and Sarah. And finally, this is maybe the most difficult idea to wrap our heads around. There is another form of procreation. There is procreation via bearing a child. And then there's procreation via creating worlds of Torah. And the Kabbalists tell us that Ben Azai, for example, and Rabbi Akiva, the great giants of the Mishnahic era, they created souls of converts with their Torah. What this means, I don't know, but the Talmud does tell us, if you teach Torah to someone else, it's as if you've given birth to them. Torah is the upgrading of souls. And when you upgrade a new soul, it's like you have, there's a brand new soul there. And therefore, if you teach Torah to someone else, Torah is creating new souls. What that means, again, I don't know. Reference my disclaimer earlier. I don't know what this means. But I do know that it is sourced in the most reputable sources that we have, that it's possible for someone via Torah study to actually spawn new souls. How that works, I don't know. But the point is, is that it, there is a mechanism, there is a system through which, through, through which new souls can be added to this category of souls that are, again, distinct from the non-Jewish souls. You are deemed Adam. And the nations are not. Now, do you see why I said you have to listen to this one twice <laughs> or maybe 101 times? We, in fact, covered a lot today. We spoke about the nature of the sin of Adam. We started off with the question, what are the unique attributes? What are the unique markers of a Jewish soul? Souls, are they just you know fungible, interchangeable entities, commodities? Every soul is different, we've been told. What is the nature of a Jewish soul versus a non-Jewish soul? So the Talmud tells us, you are called Adam. You are considered Adam. You are deemed Adam. Atem kruim Adam. What does that mean? What does Adam mean? There's lots of different things that can mean Adam. Adam on its lowest levels, Afer, Dam, Mara, ashes, blood, and bile. Just some minerals and elements that are not very expensive, not very valuable. Adam can also mean the state of man when they're etched in the throne of God. In Ezekiel's vision, Adam can also mean 
someone who's there fits the sin of Adam. Adam can also mean someone who triumphs over angels to the degree that they want to give him gifts. You are called Adam, meaning your nation comes from this tree, comes from this nation, from this people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who created or who worked harder than anyone else to rectify the sin of Adam. Adam's sin was fixed gradually in a staggered fashion. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we still have some ways to go. But the accomplishments of Abraham and Jacob was perpetuated to their descendants. So what are the differences between Jewish and non-Jewish souls? It all goes back to the patriarchs. We come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore we are deemed Adam. I thank you for listening. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.